Hi there. Welcome to Crops TV. My name is Greg Tilka, and I'm a professor at Iowa State University and a research and extension nematologist. What I'd like to talk to you today about is ramping up our game, if you will, providing extra effort to manage soybean cyst nematode. But before we get into the details of managing SCN, I want to underscore what's at stake. Um, soybean cyst nematode for the last 20 to 25 years has been annually identified as the most damaging pathogen of soybeans and the estimate of yield loss, farmer yield loss, is $1.5 billion a year. And, and that number has been verified with some statistical analyses that we won't get into today, but it's a real number for the, the production area of the United States and Canada for soybeans. Secondly, I will show you some data we've generated from Iowa that indicate that we're actually experiencing increasing yield loss every year. But before one can manage a pathogen, you have to know where it's at. And uh, I've been at Iowa State since the early 1990s, and at three times over the last three decades, we've conducted a random survey of the fields in Iowa to test for soybean cyst nematode. And to conduct a random survey requires some effort. It's not driving down a gravel road in every county and picking the third soybean field on the right or on the left. It's actually using a computer to select fields based on where soybeans are being grown in the state of Iowa. And I don't have that capacity myself, but I have partnered uh, three times with the USDA National Ag Statistics Service, or NAS, and uh, worked with their people that conduct what they call the Objective Yields Program. And they do this every year. They randomly select fields throughout the state of Iowa to measure crop growth to use in estimating crop yields as we near the harvest time each growing season. So the fields are selected based on the known areas of soybean production in the state. And then they hire people called enumerators to visit those fields and to take plant measurements to use in a model to estimate crop growth. And during these three times over the last three decades that I've worked with these people, um, I have paid them to collect a soil sample from each of those randomly selected fields and train them how to collect the samples, where to send the samples, provided them the soil probes to collect the samples. And they all came back to my laboratory at Iowa State and we tested those samples for soybean cyst nematode. So I mentioned I've done this three times in the last three decades, in the 90s, in the 2000s, and the 2010s, and the results were, were surprising to me. In the 90s, we found SCN in 70, roughly 74% of the fields that were randomly selected for sampling. Roughly 10 years later, it was in 71% of the fields that were sampled. And then 10 years after that, it was in 73% of the fields. So two things strike me about these results. Number one, um, how consistent it is over three 10-year um, time spans, two 10-year time spans, three sampling uh, periods. And secondly, that means um, based on these data, because I, I believe through randomly selected fields that SCN is present in about three-fourths of the fields in Iowa. So um, two take-home messages there. Number one, if you're growing soybeans, there's about a 70 to 75% chance your field has SCN. And then the intriguing part is what's up with that 30%, 25 to 30% of the fields where we've not detected it? Is there something about the biology, the microbes that live in the soil, uh, that are suppressing SCN, we don't know. But the practical take-home point is there's three, there's three out of four chance any field where soybeans are grown in Iowa has SCN. So that takes us to the interesting topic of how does SCN get around? And, and most anybody could probably put, um, come up with two or three ways that SCN is moved from field to field. Um, a, a common one people think of is soil on the wheels of equipment. Uh, farming equipment, tractors and, and combines, planters, tillage implements, and that's certainly uh, a truth. Uh, secondly, humans and wildlife uh, can move this as well. Humans through your shoes and wildlife, they've actually um, worked with, they've seen geese and, and birds pick at the grain in the fall 
that didn't make it into the combine. So the birds land to eat that grain. They ingest soil. And then researchers have actually uh, sorted through the droppings of those birds and looked to extract soybean cyst nematode and found live SCN eggs coming out the back end of wildlife that uh, ingest a lot of dirt while they're eating the grain. A third way that's pretty obvious for people is when we have a gully washer of a rain event and we see um, gullies and, and ruts and it, it, there's no doubt that uh, soil is getting moved from field to field and perhaps from farm to farm. And so that's an obvious one to think of. And then the one that really kind of puzzled me for a decade or two was um, windblown soil. Um, in the springtime, I've been out in the in the countryside and have seen the horizon looking kind of brownish as uh, tillage is, is going on and it's a windy day. Um, and I struggled with how to collect windblown soil. And then I had the good fortune of working with a master's student here at Iowa State. Our agronomy department has a distance master's program where um, people with full-time jobs can earn a master's degree um, online and they do a small research project. And the person I worked with in the early 2000s was named Dorian Gatchel. He has his own business in southwestern Minnesota, I believe. And he had a real interest in soybean cyst nematode and he did a project for his master's degree. But it wasn't about windblown soil. But one day we were talking about windblown soil and he said, well, why don't I collect soil from snowdrifts that we see kind of late late winter um, as some of the snows melted you start to see these dirty snowdrifts and so dorian did the hard work and he sent in 20 25 samples that he collected from snowdrifts he dried uh, melted the snow dried the soil off sent it to me and then i grew soybeans in that soil and this is what we found um, here's an example of some soybean roots grown in a sample of soil collected by Dorian from a snowdrift. And you'll see yellow, whitish yellow objects, round objects on those roots. And those are live SCN females full of eggs. We took a further step where we extracted the eggs from those females and they hatched out to produce juveniles. And so this is conclusive proof that SCN can be spread um, through windblown soil. So how would one check a field for SCN? The, the most um, direct way is to see it with your own eyes. And so we're a big proponent of getting out there and digging roots and looking for the white females. Um, those were the yellow whitish objects in the previous slide. There's another image here showing the white females. Um, they're small, but but they're able to be seen with the naked eye. They're about the size of a period at the end of a printed sentence. And so starting four to six weeks after planting, you can go out and dig roots and carefully shake the soil from the roots and look for these little white females. You can do that through June and July. And then once we get into August, they're still new ones forming on the roots, but they're forming on new roots that are two, three, four feet deep in the soil and they're hard to reach anymore. And so you eventually have to give up looking for the SCN females on the roots come the latter part of the growing season because you just can't get out of the soil with a shovel um, the, the roots that have these females. And so I think we're going to then now transition to some video of talking uh, in the field, uh, myself with uh, ISU Extension field agronomist, Megan Anderson. And we've had a discussion uh, last growing season, in season, and spent a little more time talking about looking for SCN on roots in the field. You cannot deduce numbers based on what you see on the roots. And so if you really wanna know your situation, it's the good old soil sampling, which can be done any time of the year. It can be done before planting, uh, during the season, if you see sick looking beans, but I suggest people go out and sample after harvest. And that way they know following a soybean crop, what might've happened in terms of their numbers, or it seems a little illogical, but the, the most efficient, efficient thing is to sample fields of harvested corn because if they're in a rotation, those are the fields that'll go to soybeans next year and the farmer will know 
what's laying there for them when they grow next year's crop. And that may lead into some different management decisions depending on what those numbers say. Right, exactly. Yep. Okay. And, and numbers with soybean cyst nematode are always pretty wonky or variable. And so don't read into it. If you got a soil test result back too much, uh, a thousand egg count could be from a soil sample. And if we processed a second parcel of that soil, we might get a 3000 egg count. There's that much variability. Okay. So think in general terms, low, medium, and high. Low, we say is less than 2000 eggs per half a cup of soil. Medium is two to 12,000 eggs per half a cup of soil. Anything above 12,000 heading into a soybean crop, we consider a high egg count. But the soil sample results are, I tell audiences, those results are gonna be more variable than any other numbers you've collected in farming situations in your life. They're just really variable because the females are full of 200 eggs and they're tiny. They're like the size of a period at the end of a sentence. So putting a soil probe here, you may catch four females, which represents 800 or 1,000 eggs. And if you literally would have put your probe right here, you would have missed a thousand eggs. The numbers are extremely variable, but still it's a way to get a crude idea of how bad the situation is. Okay. Well, well that should uh, answer most of the questions that people have about digging roots and looking for SCN in the field. Um, of course, there's another way to check fields for SCN and it requires kind of less strategic thinking and just getting out there and, and doing uh, a sampling. And, and so I'm talking about collecting soil samples. Um, sampling for SCN is an integral part of managing the nematode. And so some basic points, some obvious points, we want uh, uh, to use a, want you to use a soil probe, not a spade or a hand trowel. Uh, and we want cores. We'd like to have 20 cores uh, from no more than every 20 acres. You'd put those cores in a bucket like you see on the screen here and you'd mix them up real well and send them into a lab. Um, if a farmer growing soybeans has never tested for SCN, they really need to, to do that as soon as they can. And that's to, to, to do two things. Number one, know if they've got it or not and at what level. And if they don't got it, then they've got some options that we'll talk about later um, that could be pursued. But it's, it's key to know if a field has SCN. And then once it's identified as an SCN infested field, we recommend sampling before every third soybean crop just to keep an eye on the numbers. And notice I say before every, before every third soybean crop and the photograph is sampling harvested corn um, that's exactly right. So <clears throat> an a, a efficient way to sample once you know which fields have SCN is sample in the fall preceding next year's soybean crop. And so you have an opportunity to send those samples to a uh, lab to be processed and then to get the results back and make some management decisions. The samples can be sent to Iowa State's Plant and Insect Diagnostic Clinic or there are several different private soil testing labs that also offer uh, the processing of SCN samples. So once you have a handle on what fields have SCN, let's get into what's our advice on managing it. And there's really, it's a three-prong approach, um, growing non-host crops and then resistant soybean varieties, and also uh, looking at the use of nematode protectant seed treatments. So non-host crops, let's talk about that. It's a very effective management strategy to recalibrate your thinking. The photograph on the left are the white females on the roots. I showed this in an earlier slide. Those are full of eggs. And so then in the photograph on the right, we see a close-up uh, image of a single egg. And what happens with that egg is it eventually hatches to release a worm called a juvenile. And this is a weak link in the life cycle. If that juvenile does not find a soybean root to get into and establish feeding, it will either starve during a year that a non-host crop is being grown or something else is going to eat it. There are lots of other organisms in the soil that eat nematodes. And so uh, any egg that releases its hatched juvenile, that juvenile is vulnerable um, until it gets into a soybean root. So what we've seen in field research conducted in Iowa is that egg numbers 
can decrease from 5 or 10% to as much as 45 or 50% in one year of corn, right after soybeans. So again, those, those eggs that hatch, the juveniles starve, that results in a reduction in egg numbers um, that are present to, to live to infect soybeans the next year. If you were to grow corn several years in a row, we see uh, much less of a decrease in the numbers in second and third year corn. And quite frankly, after two or three years of corn, there's very little decline in egg numbers each year um, in growing corn or some other non-host continuously. And so here's a graph that kind of models what the change in egg numbers is uh, as you grow corn after soybean. So uh, what's on the, the vertical axis is number of eggs at the end of the season. And the orange bar represents um, the number of eggs in the soil after a soybean crop. So that's about 17, 18,000. And then in one year of corn, it, we can drop those numbers to 10,000 or, or below 10,000. And so we get our biggest bang for the buck, if you will, out of a non-host like corn that first year. You'll see in the graph that second year corn, the egg numbers in the soil continue to drop, but really that curve flattens out by third year corn and you're not getting much benefit from continuous corn or any other non-host crop uh, in reducing the numbers after pretty much after the second year corn. And the reason for that is Many of the eggs produced inside those little white females that I showed in, in previous uh, slides, the images, um, some of those eggs, up to half of them, can be dormant and won't hatch for a period of years no matter what we do to them. And we know that from laboratory research. We've collected eggs from females in the wild, brought them into the laboratory. Some eggs hatch just when we put them in water, as long as it's warm enough. Others, we will put a couple drops of soybean root juice in the Petri dish and more eggs will hatch, but we've never gotten more than 50% or so hatch of the eggs that we've collected and tried to hatch in the laboratory. And we believe the remaining eggs, as much as 50%, are dormant and it's gonna take them many years to slowly come out of dormancy and hatch out. And if you think about it, that's a pretty good survival mechanism for the nematode to not uh, have all the eggs hatch in any given moment. But don't let me dissuade you from growing corn or any other non-host crop. This is an extremely important management strategy, and I'm a little bit nervous that there is some interest in growing continuous soybeans or at least a couple years of beans on beans um, because there's an estimated um, increase in the demand for soybean oil, and uh, that would not be recommended. Um, it would be bad news to be done in a field that has soybean cyst nematode. But to put a positive spin on it, um, if you knew which fields that you farmed had soybean cyst nematode and which you didn't, uh, then you could use that information to maybe strategically grow continuous soybeans in fields that have low or no soybean cyst nematode. Knowing the status of your fields and the egg count allows you uh, flexibility and the ability to make some strategic decisions. The second management strategy is to grow resistant soybean varieties. And I started at Iowa State in 1990, and uh, it was fairly easy to help farmers manage SCN. It was a matter of having them identify which fields had SCN and to buy and plant a resistant soybean. And you would often get results, usually get results, like are shown on the screen here. The resistant soybean on the right, much taller, more vigorous than the stunted yellowish susceptible soybeans on the left. And the yields were commensurate with the appearance of these plants. That yields could have doubled with the resistant soybean compared to the susceptible soybean. It was that simple. Back then, we knew uh, certainly that not all resistant varieties yielded equally, even if they were resistant. There were other factors involved, other agronomic attributes or traits that made plants higher yielding or lower yielding. And we also had a feel that they all didn't, all the resistant varieties didn't suppress the nematode numbers the same. And so Iowa State, my program, has looked at both the yield and the reduction in nematode numbers provided by resistant soybeans. But back in the day when resistance worked this well, 
um, is is not the world we live in anymore. And and the second point is a, a contemporary point uh, of 2024, and that is that varieties that used to be resistant to SCN may not be resistant anymore. And that's the world uh, we live in and farm in today. And I'm going to delve into that a bit more right now. So since the early 90s, I've put together a list of SCN resistant soybean varieties for farmers and uh, shared it with them just to help them know what their options were. And this bar chart shows the number of varieties from the early 90s through 2023. And what you see on the screen obviously is an increase, a very nice ramping up of the availability of SCN resistant varieties for Iowa. It's a great success story from the, the seed industries that support Iowa farmers. Now to, to make a resistant variety is no easy task. Um, one would have to take a good agronomic soybean variety that has great attributes other than nematode resistance and cross it with one of these breeding lines that are shown in the box to the left there. So these are soybean um, plants, soybean lines, that are known to contain resistance genes for soybean cyst nematode. And the important point here is they are terrible agronomically. Nobody in their right mind would grow a field of Peking or a field of PI88788. So the magic that the breeders do is to cross plants that have useful genes, but terrible agronomics with good agronomic soybean plants. And then after back crossing and purification, look for offspring or progeny of the cross that have both those good agronomics as well as the nematode resistance. And so it, it's no easy task. And you can see based on the, the increase in the length of the bars in the decade of the 90s, it took about a decade before um, there were hundreds of resistant varieties available. But clearly, uh, it's easy to now uh, find resistant soybean varieties available to grow in Iowa. What's not easy though, is to find a diversity of resistance genetics. So in the previous slide, I showed seven different breeding lines that could be used to develop resistant soybeans. Uh, this bar chart is the exact same data as the previous graph, except that I've color coded the varieties, the number of varieties that come from PI88788 or any of the other six sources. And so what we see here is what I call a sea of gray, and that's a bit problematic um, because of uh, selection pressure. I tell audiences, imagine if this graph represented herbicide choices, and the previous graph with just the bars would show a great increase in the availability of herbicides, but this graph would show that um, almost everything is of one active ingredient. You can think of resistant genetics as an active ingredient. So PI88788 is kind of an active ingredient that has been grown now widely, very widely, for almost 20 years. And that has created some problems. So we're going to go to the field again. This time, um, I spent some time at a plot in Farnhamville with uh, Dan Bjorklund from Landis, and we started talking about um, PI88788 and other sources of resistance and, and what we can expect in their performance moving forward. This particular plot, um, we started looking several years ago um, because of your research on, on the, the peaking Source of resistance. Yeah. Source of resistance yeah. not showing as much reproduction as the yeah. PI88. So we have 38 varieties out here all together, and um, five of those are a Peking. And we have a difference right here. We've got the Peking on the left, and we've got a PI88. Yeah. June 7th, we went out and dug and started finding um, uh, some of the cysts. On the 8878. On the 8788. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so with your research and with everything that you've discussed over the last, man, five, six, seven years, uh, you've made a real believer in me that we have to manage differently than yeah. we did when we were just yeah. using the 88. Yeah. What, what do we need to do? Well, so um, in the old days, 88788 resistance was much better and they would have, these plants probably would have been a lot taller than the Peking varieties that existed back then. And that's why the whole industry, 95% of what's available to farmers is this 88788. But 
it's the same set of resistance genes and you've probably heard me say to audiences imagine what would happen if you used one herbicide active ingredient for two decades or three decades and and it's the exact same force of nature so here we are it might not translate to video but we're standing at the junction between a pi88788 plot and a peking and this one is here and this is literally 12 inches shorter and so we now farm in a world where peking varieties are higher yielding than 88788. And that was a tough thing for soybean breeders to wrap their heads around and embrace, but we're turning the corner. I keep track of resistant varieties. And last year, our list had 18 Peking varieties. I'm happy to say that in our experiments this year, we have 45 Peking varieties available. Well, hopefully you enjoyed the discussion we had in the field. Um, it's nice this time of year to see uh, nice green soybeans on a sunny day. And uh, it's good to hear from a practitioner like Dan about what's happening in terms of um, resistant soybean varieties and their genetics out in the field. So I'd like to pick up or follow up with the same graph I left you with before the video. And uh, just the, the little orange pop-up box there to the right puts some numbers to our most recent publication. So we released our uh, most recent list of SCN resistant soybean varieties in October of 2023. There were 866 to pick from. Most of them had PI88788 because the bar is gray, you see there. But there were 87 peaking varieties. Basically, all of the non-88788 resistant varieties had Peking. Although, interestingly, there were five blends of Peking and 88788 beans, and those blends are physical mixtures of seed of a resistant soybean variety and a, um, of, with Peking and a resistant soybean variety with PI88788. The bottom bullet point there, note that there's virtually no susceptible soybeans available anymore from major seed companies. And so anything a farmer is, is growing is going to have either PI88788 resistance or Peking resistance. Oh, by the way, this uh, list of cyst-resistant soybean varieties is an Iowa State Extension uh, publication. And if you'd like to search for that on the internet and download a PDF file of it, you'd simply have to Google or use a search engine and search for Iowa State Crop 1649. And that'll take you right to our extension publication store where you can download a PDF file. So I mentioned that uh, intuitively we knew that resistant soybean varieties yielded differently and also maybe controlled nematode uh, numbers differently since the early 90s. And, and so my laboratory at Iowa State has been looking and conducting experiments to test that since the 1990s. And uh, our current set up to do these experiments is we do three experiments across northern Iowa, three across central Iowa, and three across southern Iowa. And the key point here is these experiments or studies are in farmer fields. We don't do them at ISU research farms. We do them at farmer's fields on purpose because we feel that it's more representative or it's representative of, of what farming is um, having an effect on the nematode populations across the state now. Granted, it's only nine locations, but uh, we want to work in farmers' fields. Uh, we always follow corn, and we never work in an area of a field or in a field where we've had studies in the past, because once we do an experiment one year, um, we leave behind a patchwork of um, different nematode egg counts and different um, yield responses, and we don't want to do a new experiment planting into uh, such variability. So this is what one of these experiments looks like from the air. Our standard experimental unit, if you will, is a four-row plot. So it's four rows wide by 17 feet long. And what you see on the screen are many four-row plots planted side by side by side, and then there's, there's columns of them. So there's a three-foot alley in between every row of side-by-side-by-side -side -side four-row plots. And we plant those plots, we measure yield from those plots, and we collect a 10-core soil sample in the middle of each four-row plot at the time we plant the plot and then again at harvest.
So we have in a very small area, four rows wide by 17 feet long, we have two soil samples for egg counts beginning and end of the season, and then we have the yield from that plot. And the image in the top right there that has all the yellow dots, that's to emphasize how intensive we sample the study. And those yellow dots aren't individual soil cores. Those are 10 core soil samples. So there are thousands of soil cores collected to represent this uh, study area. Now we report the yields of resistant soybean varieties um, and how they control nematode numbers. And I'm gonna show you a little bit of those results in some upcoming slides. But if you wanna see the full report, um, you could Google online Iowa State IPM 52, and that would take you to the extension store again, and you could download a PDF file. It's also this printed, this is a report that's printed and it shows up in the Iowa Farmer today in January. And um, in an upcoming slide, I'll show you um, what issue and what the report looks like. But if you just wanna hop on the internet and get a PDF copy, uh, search for Iowa State IPM 52. So that's for, that'll show you the yield results for hundreds of resistant soybean varieties. But I'm always looking to get more information out of our experiments. And so the valuable piece of information, additional valuable piece of information from our variety experiments is the fact that the spring samples we collect, those yellow dots on there on our 10 core samples, there's always soil left over. We collect more soil than we need in case we drop something in the laboratory or whatever. So there's, there's always a lot of soil left over and we take all of that soil from all of those yellow dots after we're done processing for a starting egg count, we mix all that soil up and then we grow pure PI88788 breeding line or pure Peking breeding line in that soil. And we're able to test for the nematode living in that farmer's field, how well the nematode can reproduce on 88788 and Peking. So it's, it's a way to very precisely use the same nematode sample that we're using for our research plots and measure nematode control, if you will, uh, by Peking and 88788. And each field's gonna be different because each field contains a different nematode population. So what I'm gonna show you is a summary of data from these field experiments that we've done over the last 24 growing seasons. We've worked in 201 different field locations and what you're gonna see on the vertical axis is the SCN female index or percent reproduction. And what that means is the, the level of control uh, of the nematode. So we would want numbers or dots that represent fields to be low on this graph um, because that would mean a low female index or low level of reproduction. Um, the higher the level of the dots on the graph will mean that the nematode has developed the ability to increase its reproduction on pure PI88788 breeding line. So as the little box says there in the top left, each data point represents a nematode from a field where we did a variety trial experiment. The last thing I wanna mention is that the scientific definition of SCN resistance is to have less than 10% reproduction. So ideally, if PI88788 is working well in a field, the dots from the fields that I'm about to show you should be below that green 10% line. So here is what <clears throat> we have determined in the fields we've done experiments over the last 24 growing seasons. And what you see in 2000, 2001, 02, we're getting pretty good control of the nematode in those farmer fields by pure 88788, but we see a troubling trend moving forward to the point where it's clear that there is a really steep increase in the level of reproduction of SCN populations uh, on 88788. Here's the exact same nematodes from the exact same fields, but this is how well they grew on pure Peking um, resistant source. And it's a much uh, less troubling uh, set of data, if you will. The yellow or the red boxes, they represent reproduction of the nematode on pure Peking. And we see most of the little boxes are below 10%. 
and uh, we see a few above, but all in all, compared to the previous slide, um, this shows a much greater level of control with the peaking resistance. And so early on in my presentation, I said yield loss is increasing. Uh, my defense of that is there is way more nematode reproduction on the very easy to buy 88788 resistant soybean varieties than there was 20 some years ago. And I know that soybean breeders do a great job of increasing the yield potential over the years um, of the varieties that are coming to the market. But um, I'm gonna show you some data to, to uh, indicate, to, to prove that, that there is a real significant yield toll, if you will, uh, from that elevated reproduction on 88788 that you see uh, on the right side of the graph. So let's go back to the field and uh, join Dan Bjorklund again and talk about uh, the yield of Peking resistant beans that uh, I've experienced and also some of Dan's experiences as well. well. One of the things that we noticed last year, there were a couple things. Um, we had plots like this throughout uh, the Landis area that, that, that we cover and we had them set up fairly similar, but we only had two Peking I think three peaking varieties last year. When we got the yield data, now these weren't replicated, so you know it's, it's anecdotal from that standpoint statistically, but when every plot, when you're looking at 14 to 20 plots, and every plot had the peaking in the top three, and in half of those plots, there was a 2.7 that won outright. And then afterwards, when we were doing grower meetings, um, individuals would come up, we were talking about tar spot and other different things, but indiv individuals would come up and say, you know, for only 10 or 15 inches of rain for the whole growing season, I am amazed at what I got on corn yields, but very disappointed in soybean yields. Yeah. How do we get our growers yeah. to really, really take a hold of this yeah. and to look at, at management? Because I've been doing this for 40 years and um, it's difficult to get people to yeah. change. Well, first off, I feel your pain. I've been doing it for 33 years, so <laughs> um, it's frustrating. It's really frustrating. And my experience is it's bushels per acre. And so that's why we do, with great funding from the Iowa Soybean Association, we do all these experiments evaluating varieties. And much like your demo plots, Peking varieties, they are guaranteed now yield-wise in the top five in any one of the nine locations we have. So. I think the word hopefully is going to spread to the farmers about yields. Well, again, as before, it's really nice to uh, see uh, people talking in a nice uh, warm uh, field in the middle of Iowa, in the middle of growing season with green beans. Um, but uh, let's get back into the data to follow up on the conversation we just heard about yield potential. So earlier in my presentation, I mentioned these experiments we do at nine locations throughout Iowa. Um, kind of our flagship or bellwether location is always Fruitland in southeast Iowa because it has very sandy soil and the nematode thrives on sandy soil, um, especially because it, it's drier. Um, typically, the, the sandy soils are drier and SCN reproduction is much greater in dry soils than soils with average or excess moisture. Um, here are some results that are really eye-opening from 2019. Remember, we rent from farmers. And so in this particular farmer location, um, the starting egg count up on the top right was 4,687 4, eggs per half a cup of soil. And there was pretty high reproduction of the nematode in that field on 88788 and no reproduction on Peking. So this graph shows 72 varieties the yields of those at the end of the season. The three bars on the right that are kind of orangish were the susceptible standards we included. Um, in the middle, the gray bars are PI88788 varieties. And then there weren't a lot of late maturity group three varieties with peaking resistance available, but we were able to get two, those shown in green uh, there on the left. So the 88788 varieties for the experiment averaged 51 bushels per acre. There were there on the left some 88788 varieties that were at 59 bushels per acre, uh, but there were others that were down around 40, so a bit of a range. Uh, but in general, 51 bushels per acre from 88788. 
The Peking varieties average 72 bushels per acre. And I mentioned we rent from farmers. This was a small 30 acre field. We only use about five acres. So he had about 25 acres around us. And I asked him what variety he grew. He couldn't get seed of a Peking variety. And so he ended up growing a variety that happened to be in our experiment. So that variety that he grew around us yielded 50 bushels per acre. We got 72 bushels per acre out of the Peking beans. And let's just do a little very simple math. The yield difference between those is 22 bushels per acre. Soybeans were selling at $9 a bushel back then. And so that farmer in the 25 acres around us lost out on roughly $200 an acre because he had to grow a resistance for SCN that was ineffective. And that's just per acre. And the 25 acres around us totaled almost $5,000 in lost income. So one might say, well, that's just a crazy aberration, one year, one location. I will give you, uh, I will acknowledge that we get maximum reproduction and yield loss from Fruitland, but it wasn't a one year deal. Um, oh, let's play forward to the, the new numbers that just popped up on the screen. Same yield difference, 22 bushels per acre, beans selling at $12 a bushel, $269 an acre in lost income, or over $6,700 for that 25 acres. So again, it's not a one-year occurrence though, because of this. Um, end of season numbers, so in addition to the yield, the great yield difference between Peking and 88788, here are the end of season egg counts under those plots. Um, reorient yourself in the top right. We started out with 4,687 eggs. At the end of the season, under the susceptibles, they increased to over 13,000. Under all of the 88788 varieties, they increased to over 14,000. And the numbers under the plots with those two Peking varieties or almost undetectable, 800 eggs per half a cup of soil. That is gonna have major effects on soybean production two years from now. So there's a legacy effect in addition to a short-term income effect of growing Peking resistant beans versus 88788. Now here's a page out of our variety trial report that I'll zoom in for you. Um, it's the same farmer, different field down in Fruitland, and we had 20 some, no, we had nine Peking varieties in this location in 2023. Uh, you see on the top right, we started out with 1,174 eggs and look where the, the top varieties are. All nine or eight of the varieties that had Peking resistance finished in the top of the, the experiment. And then the, the way this is organized, the left column is the brand of soybeans the variety names, the next column, relative maturity, and then source of resistance, where you see all the Peking listed. There's a, a column for herbicide tolerance, and then SCN end of season numbers, and then SCN RF, which is the change in numbers from fall to spring. And we highlight, highlight any variety in which over the season it decreased SCN numbers. And then, of course, the, the column that everybody wants to take a look at is the yield, which is the far right column. You see the yield number plus the bars. And I want you to look at the drop off in yields. There's a nine bushel per acre drop off between the top nine peaking varieties and the top 88788 variety. So, again, this trend of much greater increase in yields. And then also look at the column of SCN numbers. Um, for the Peking varieties, those numbers all bounce around 1,000, there's 350, there's 300, and they're about the same as our starting egg count, which is again shown in that top right pop-up box. So very good nematode control moving forward will affect future soybean production and greater source of income. The last data I want to show you is a field farthest away from Fruitland in northwest Iowa. Just to convince you that it's not just a sandy soil southern Iowa phenomenon, in Lorenz, northwest Iowa in 2023, we had 20-some Peking varieties, and they didn't all finish in the top, but here is a, a table 
organized the same as the previous table, brand, variety, relative maturity, nematode resistance, etc. Yields are on the right, and then the columns um, to the left of the yield is the nematode control. Um, varieties listed from highest yielding to lowest yielding, we had, there's like seven Peking there in the top 10. We don't see the tremendous drop-off in yields on the right column that we did from Fruitland, but there, there's maximum yields out of those varieties as well. So Peking is something that is uh, now meet, has come to uh, fruition. It's high yielding and it offers nematode control and people got to start using it. Final point I'll make about this data that we generate is if you want to see that report I mentioned earlier about um, it's Iowa State IPM 52, if you want to search for that, or if you get the Iowa Farmer today, it was a printed special insert in the January 13th issue. The last thing I want to talk about is uh, moving forward. As farmers grow varieties with peaking resistance, I'm quite certain they're going to harvest higher yields. And with higher yields, they're going to want to grow them every time. I, I would do the same thing. When you see yield differences like we got from Fruitland last year, uh, shown on this pop-up, um, you would be crazy, it would seem, to not grow those Peking beans all the time. But to grow those, those Peking soybeans all the time would be bad. And that's because of the breakdown of resistance. Now, PI88788 resistance lasted us 20 to 25 years. It was about 90 to 95% effective at first. But as we've seen, as I've just shown you, it lost its effectiveness over time. So we used to get that in the early days of 88788. We can no longer get this kind of performance anymore. Peking is an order of magnitude more effective than 88788 was. It's like 99.9% .9 effective at first. It's not 100% effective. There will be a few successful nematodes reproducing. And then we have three to six turns of the life cycle during a growing season for SCN. And because of that, it acts like a high dose pesticide. It's If you have extremely effective high dose but there's a few survivors, the selection pressure is great, and the breakdown happens rapidly. So trust me, it is very likely that Peking is going to lose its effectiveness much quicker than 88788 because Peking is so highly effective at first. And I'll just remind you, you've seen this graph before. These are the nematode reproduction levels on Peking um, from our experiments. I showed you this earlier. And while in general, this is a much better graph than the, the, the graph of the with the blue dots for 88788. There are fields that have nematodes with uh, increased reproduction on Peking. And also, I'm getting reports of SCN females being observed on their roots of varieties with Peking resistance. Finally, I'll remind you that we don't have a great prospect of having numerous varieties with a third different traditional source of resistance. Remember this bar graph, I show the different breeding lines on the left. I show you that almost everything is 88788, but the red portion of the bar graph for 2023, um, that was all Peking. And so there is no third source of traditional resistance in the breeding programs at the moment. And so for the foreseeable future, we have Peking to use and we have PI88788. Now to finish on a, perhaps an optimistic note, um, there, there are some develops um, happening. Um, the green box of text at the top states that there is some novel SCN resistance that uses BT, and that's the same Bacillus thuringiensis concept that we use for insect control in the past. Um, BASF has developed an SCN resistance based on BT. The EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency at the U.S., approved it in 2020, and the company estimates it'll be available by 2029, and there's an agreement in place that it'll be offered by Corteva BASF 
and MS technologies. Now, this is going to be an incremental improvement in our ability to manage soybean cyst nematode, but it's not going to be a widely available third source of resistance. It's going to be an improvement of our existing resistance for soybeans from those three sources. So let's go back to the field one last time and talk about using PI88788 resistance and Peking resistance uh, moving towards the future. What should we do for management with PI88s versus Peking yeah. in the long term? Yeah. So um, first of all, thank you for paying attention to our numbers, our, our, our research numbers, because we do it for this purpose. And it kind of informs not only the current situation, but how we want to move forward. So. Uh, you're exactly right. Um, right now in experiments with PI88788, the end egg counts are going to be in the tens of thousands. And I almost can't put them in the same bar graph with the egg counts for the Peking because the bars, you know, almost can't see them. They're so small compared to those big bars. And that'll pay dividends, those low egg counts moving forward. But there's a problem with Peking and it, it emphasizes the fact that we need to take a systems approach. So Peking resistance works great and farmers are gonna harvest more bushels per acre. And so their temptation is gonna to be to just switch completely to Peking. And say what we will, say what I will about PI88788, it lasted us several decades. Peking is not gonna last several decades because of the nature of the resistance. It's very fast acting very effective, but there's always some survivors, and the stronger the mode of action, the quicker the survivors can build up. So we don't anticipate Peking being effective for 20 some years, so farmers are gonna, are gonna be discouraged. I'm gonna discourage them from growing all Peking. So um, new recommendations are broad spectrum. They are First off, corn and soybean rotation, because we know FCN numbers drop in a year of corn. And then everybody, if they can get them, should start growing Peking, and nobody should grow continuous Peking. So we need them to continue to grow the best 88788 in rotation to alternate with corn. And then the final piece of the puzzle are these seed treatments that have come on the market. We've seen variable results and they can add a couple to five bushels per acre. And so it's a systems approach. And like many things in crop production, there's no magic bullet, no one answer, but Peking is great. It's just, if we use it as the only solution, we're gonna lose it a lot quicker than we lost 88788. Well, hopefully if you, you found the, those last comments in the video useful underscoring how serious of a situation this is um, really to stay in the game and maximize our soybean yields moving forward, we need to put a little extra effort into managing soybean cyst nematode. And to summarize, basically the, the take home points from this entire presentation, um, farmers need to know which fields are infested with SCN at what levels, and they need to continue to grow soybeans in rotation with corn to keep that non-host crop in. Um, they need to know the genetic source of the SCN resistance of the varieties they're growing. And we have that publication Crop 1649 to help you figure that out. And we need to not grow peaking SCN resistance continuously. You, you grow peaking resistance after 88788 resistance or vice versa to maintain the sustainability of Peking resistance. And also that underscores um, the need to pick and continue to use high yielding varieties with PI88788 resistance. And not to ignore another uh, option for managing soybean cyst nematode. There are several different nematode protectant seed treatments available for farmers to use in the fields. We've not seen consistent trends in the performance or the effects of those seed treatments on soybean yields in our experiments, but there are locations where there are yield responses. And so I think that's a more local um, phenomenon that needs to be sorted out on a farm by farm or field by field basis. So I encourage people to evaluate these seed treatments in fields to see which ones protect, uh, provide yield protection on a local basis. Thank you for joining me today and listening to these comments. And for ISU Extension and Crops TV, I'm Greg Tilka. <music>